house needs paint, the grass needs mowing, and where's he at? Hey, this is Earl. Now that show was stronger than the Sonic Mother. <laughs> hey, and welcome to Hank Parker Off the Water. I'm Hank Parker and my co-host, my beautiful granddaughter, Sarah Beth. Hello. And we're here for our second podcast. And we talked about a lot of things on our first one, told about who I am and uh, told a few stories. And one, we started off talking about Buck Perry and the trolling spoon. Now, here we are in an era where we're talking about live sonar, where we have forward-facing sonar that we can see the lure and the fish. And that's how far we came from zero depth finders to trolling with a spoon to find the underwater structure to now we're watching fish bite our lure. So uh, there's a lot of stories to be told and I love a podcast because you don't have to necessarily storyboard step by step where you're going. You can kind of mix it up, circle the wagon and tell some stories. So I have a, I have a, uh, a lot of of stories to tell Sarah Beth about uh, the early days that some people may have never known and some people may have <laughs> forgotten. Yeah, I mean, I've got, I have plenty. Um, I remember being one of our family fishing Well, now, wait shows. a minute. Hold on. We're not going to go into that. I, I, I don't <laughs> want to hear that. <laughs> you well, let's, let's start off and let's talk about uh, the early days of the Bassmaster Classic. You know, the first Bassmaster Classic they had was a $10,000 winner-take-all first prize. Wow. There were 25 anglers, and they got on an airplane, had no idea where they were going. They were allowed to take 10 pounds of fishing tackle and five rods and reels. Had no idea where they were going. Uh, they met at Atlanta Airport. They got on the plane, and when they got about 25,000 feet in altitude, Ray Scott gave them an envelope. And you opened that up, and it told you where they're going. First tournament they went was Lake Mead. Mm. But the guy that won that tournament, his name was Bobby Murray. And Bobby Murray became one of my all-time heroes. Now, I got a lot of heroes in the sport. But Bobby Murray became one of my all-time heroes, won the first Bassmaster Classic. He also won the first Bassmaster Classic that I fished in uh, in, in 1978. Oh, wow. So Bobby became my hero. And so in like 1981, I drew Bobby Murray at uh, Lake Gaston on the Virginia-North Carolina border. I drew him the second day of the tournament for a partner. Now Bobby was in like fourth place after the first day and I was in like 140th place. I didn't do so big. I did. I didn't do so very good the first no. day, and uh, so Bobby had caught his fish on a little uh, on a little small jerk bait in a stump bed in the back of a pocket, and so we go in there and we fish the first two hours of the tournament the second day, and the way it worked back in those days is uh, if you drew a partner the first day of the tournament, you often flipped a coin to decide whose boat you're going to go in. Because we fished against our own competitors. I mean, I was competing against Bobby Murray, so here two competitors are paired together, not like today uh, where you got a co-rider or a, a co-angler or somebody that's just an observer or whatever they have set up in different events. But we always had a competitor, mm. and that was a check and balance system because you couldn't cheat. Because you, you're competing against that guy. Yeah. And that was kind of Ray Scott's whole idea behind how to keep a check and balance system where there would be no cheating going on in Ray Scott's tournaments. So I drew Bobby Murray. I went in his boat. We went to his fish. He's in fourth place. And we bomb out. Nothing. And so Bobby looks at me and says, hey, man, I uh, – I'm, I, I don't know what to do. You got any backups? I said, Bobby, I was killing them. I was killing them on a buzz bait in practice. And I said, yesterday was a bluebird day. I had a lot of short strikes. But I think with this cloud cover we have today, I think if we go back to my original pattern and go to the area I was catching them in, I think we can catch them. So he said, I'm game. So we went. And we killed them. I mean, we hammered them. 
So it was about uh, about an hour and a half before weigh-in, and he and I both see this one stump up there, and we know based on what's been happening that day, there's a good chance there's going to be a fish on that stump. So we kind of got in a casting contest, and I just got lucky and made a perfect cast, and boom, I caught one over seven pounds. Well, as soon as I got that fish in the boat, I'm culling now. I've got three pounders I'm throwing back. And so I had that seven pounder, and I culled, and uh, Bobby said, okay, we got an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes by the time we get down to where I'm, I want to go to fish, and then we got to go the way in. I want to go fish a jig. Well, I never heard of a jig. No. I, I thought he's talking about a little bucktail jig. Yeah. Uh, he's talking about a live rubber jig like we fish today that everybody's familiar with. Well, I, I wasn't familiar with that at all. So we go down and we get to this place, and first of all, I just caught a seven-pound fish on a buzz bait, and now you're going to take me to some area and fish a jig? Are you crazy? <laughs> There's no way I would have gone for that had it not been Bobby Murray, my hero. Mm -hmm. Bobby Murray caught fish in shallow water, deep water, clear water, muddy water, cold water, hot water. It didn't matter. Bobby Murray caught fish. You look at the scoreboard in Bassmaster Magazine, mm -hmm. and Bobby's always up there toward the top. So I had deep respect, and now he wants to go fish this jig. Well, we get down there, and like I say, I didn't even know what a jig was. He pulled this thing out with all these rubber bands and legs on it, and uh, he got a jar of Uncle Josh pork rind. You don't hear much about that anymore, but that was a big deal back in the 80s. And he got this pork rind out. Well, pork rind is tougher than nails, but it comes with a pre-cut hole. Mm -hmm. And so he hooks that pork rind on. And he catches about a six-and-a-half-pound bass on the first cast. Mm. And I thought, wow. So I'm, I'm, I, I don't even know what to cast. I'm still throwing a buzz bait, and, and we're on this riprap rock, and he, he's, he's fishing these docks and this riprap, and he's using that jig, and he catches another one about five pounds. Well, Bobby's not a very tall guy. So uh, when he caught that second fish, and I netted it back in the days we could net, I netted the fish, and uh, I said, uh, Bobby, give me one of those jigs, or I'll kill you. <laughs> and uh, he quickly agreed I needed to have a jig. <laughs> and he said, they're in the top of my tackle box. The pork rind's right there. Well, again, I didn't even know anything about pork rind. Well, I had a pre-cut hole. Well, I didn't know that. I just worked and worked and worked and finally got that hook through that pork rind which took me forever. Mm -hmm. Well, by the time I got it on and got it tied on my line, He's hollering for the net again. Well, he catches another giant fish, about a six-pounder. Well, when I dipped that thing up, I looked, and he's got his pork rind on skin side first. I put my pork rind on fat side first. So now I got my pork rind on backwards. Oh. So I got to turn it around. Well, I'm down there making all kind of noises, whining and hollering and trying to get that. Well, there is no way you're going to get that hook out of that pork rind. And he said, what are you doing? I said, I put my pork rind on backwards, and I'm turning it around. He said, you big old dummy. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> it makes absolutely no difference. Get up here and fish. First cast I ever made with a jig and pig with Bobby Murray in my, life, in my boat, or in his boat, in a BASS tournament. First cast ever. I caught an 814. Wow. And Bobby dipped him. I mean, it's a giant. And so I'm back there culling. I stand up. Bobby hadn't caught any more. I cast back in there, and I catch another one, about seven pounds. Wow. And, and Bobby's, boy, he's steady chunking. He's, <laughs> he's burning that water up now. So I get back there and cull again, and then I come right back to the boat, front of the boat, stand right beside of Bobby, and I cast, and I hook a giant. I mean a 10-plus pound fish. And that thing jumps and turns double back flips, and Bobby gets the, the net, and uh, he comes off. I lose that fish. Mm -hmm. No, I'm heartbroken. But it's okay. I got a big string of fish, and I just lost a, a giant. Well, during that time, from the time I started fishing, Bobby hadn't had another bite. So he gets down in the bottom of the boat, and he's down there messing around. I said, what are you doing? <laughs> he said, I'm turning this dang pork right away. <laughs> Uh, so it shows that pro fishermen can get rattled pretty quick. You know, I, I stood up there and I got three bites in a row and they were all giants and he hadn't got another bite. So you can put pork rind on backwards, I guess. But <laughs> that, that was a story that uh, 
I, I love to tell it. I love to tell that in his presence, and he just uh, <laughs> he just shakes his head. But what a great fisherman! What a great sport! What a great friend uh, is Bobby Murray, and I got credit for being the the first guy to retire after winning the Bassmaster Classic, and didn't only win one. I won two. And I retired after I won my second Bassmaster Classic. And so Hank Parker's the first guy to ever do that. No, that's not true. Bobby Murray's the first guy to ever do that. Wow. Bobby Murray won the Classic in 71, the first one. And then he won it again in 1978. And he retired as on top of the game, the world champion. So Hank Parker wasn't the first guy to do that. Bobby Murray was the first guy to do that. Hey, you put those pork rinds on backwards. He said, you the first to retire, too. Look at you. <laughs> that, that may have made him retire, putting that pork rind on backwards. I don't know. But he won the Classic in uh, at Ross Barnett in 1978 and retired. Wow. So we, we got a lot of fishing stories now. Sarah Beth, you've been on a few uh, ventures uh, back in the old days when we had the Kids Corner mm -hmm. and we had uh, the Family Fishing Show. You remember mm -hmm. the Family Fishing Show oh, days? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember it. Um, I will say, you know, we had about, what, 10, 11, 15 little kids running around, and you're trying to be so intentional to try to make sure each one of us is having fun and we're catching fish. But I'll tell you what, it gets frustrating because me and, and myself, you know, I, I don't think to move away from the tree standing right there, you know. So every time I go to cast, my line gets caught in the tree, and – Papa, Papa, I need you to come get my line out the tree. He got it out the first time. All right, all right, there you go. Now, now keep fishing. Five minutes later, Papa, my line's stuck in the tree, and he's got 15 million things going on. And, you know, by about that sixth time that line gets caught in that tree, I mean, he's like, Sarah Beth, can you just move 10 feet, 10 feet? Just, just, move, just move over. And, I mean, it's just it, it was chaos. It was so fun. I mean, us kids, we don't, we don't understand – you know, the chaos that's going on. We're having fun. Papa's over here sweating, trying to run around. He's tying, you know, he's putting baits on the hooks, and he's trying to get all of us set up. And, I mean, we got to one point where, you know, he, he likes everybody to catch a fish and reel it in because, you know, it's just something so special. Even if you're young enough where it's like you, you don't know that you're catching the fish. It's just you're reeling something in. He caught one fish, and he's like, all right, Kate, come reel it in. <laughs> By about the fourth grandkid reeling in this fish, this fish is floating on the top of the water just getting reeled in. <laughs> I can't believe you'd tell that on me. <laughs> the, you know, the most stressful uh, TV shows I've ever done were the family shows. I'd have 14 kids <laughs> hung up all at one time. Bop, 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 bop. So, yeah. And you were the ringleader. You, yeah. you threw in that one. I remember at the Jordan Lake, you threw in that one tree <laughs> 15 times. I know. I know. <laughs> hey, I told my mom, I was like, you had to drop me like, on my head as a kid or something. Because, I mean, like, for some reason, that just did not correlate to me to just move 10 feet away from the tree. But, you know, hey, that's a little girl sitting there with that Barbie rod. <laughs> we had people coming from all over the country looking at a tree, thought it was a barber. Barber, bobber barber, tree. Barber tree. <laughs> and so many bobbers hanging in that one tree uh, that we broke off. But it yeah. was it was good times. It was. It really was. I mean, I was decorating that tree. Yeah. <laughs> and we look back, it, it is a lot more fun. Uh, and my old buddy, Franco Hill. I, I got to tell one on Franco Hill. And this is what I love about a podcast. We can go all over the place and just tell fishing stories. But uh, Franco Hill was a guy from Union, South Carolina, where I live now. And he's the reason I live here. I, I came here uh, to deer hunt on his property. I met him at the Metrolina Boat Show in Charlotte, North Carolina, about 1979. And uh, he, he was trying to run a paper chart recorder. Humminbird had just come out uh, with a paper chart recorder. And he said, man, if you can show me how to use this thing, if you take me out on the water and show me how to use this thing, I'll let you deer hunt on my land. So we made a deal. And uh, so I would, I would hunt and fish and, uh, with, with Franco. But Franco was a nut. He made jewelry out of quail droppings. He, he, he ended up on Johnny Carson show. And uh, Hal Needham and Burt Reynolds both saw him and thought he would be the perfect actor uh, to be Dad Siegler in the movie Stroker Ace. And uh, so he became quite famous as the movie star. He was Dad Siegler and Stroker Ace. And, uh, but he loved more than anything in the world to catch stripers. Mm -hmm. And so I lived on Lake Norman at the time. And uh, 
I worked with uh, Berkeley, and Berkeley had uh, acquired Fenwick, and Fenwick made a rod called Aramid Veil, AV, AV, and they were super expensive rods. Well, they wanted me to use them and and see what I thought about the technology of of Aramid Veil. And so they sent me several of these rods. Now, they said, now, we don't want you to use them on television, and we don't want you to use them in public, but when you mm -hmm. fish for fun, we want you to fish with them and just see what they feel like and, and give us your feedback on, um, on the new technology of the way this rod is built. So I had several of them, and I had a Hank Parker signature reel at the time. So mm -hmm. I called Franco. The stripers were biting up on Lake Norman. I called Franco, and I said, uh, Franco, the stripers are biting pretty good. Why don't you come up here and spend the night, and uh, you and I will go fishing in the morning. He said, I'd love to do that, Hanky. Never called me Hank in my <laughs> life. It was always <clears throat> it was always Hanky. So he said, I'd love to do that, Hanky. I'll come on up. So he did. Well, before he got there, I'd put him some brand-new trialing line on that Hank Parker reel, and I put him a bucktail on there that we're catching stripers on. And that new Airman Vale rod. So it was probably a, at that era, it was probably a $150, $200 rod and reel, which was extremely expensive. And so I gave it to him. Mm -hmm. And he said, Hanky, you going to give me this to take home for my very own? I said, oh. yep, Franco, it's your very own rod and reel. So I had a couple rigged up my boat, and I rigged him up one. And we took off, and we went striper fishing. And we're catching a lot of fish, and everything's going good. And about 8 o'clock in the morning, there got to be more and more and more boats. Mm -hmm. Well, the seagulls will dive on the water and show you where the stripers are. So I'm a bird watcher. And the minute I would see, and I pride myself on being a pretty good bird watcher, I kind of can tell by the way the birds are forming where they're going to dive next, where the school of fish is. Mm -hmm. So I'm ready to roll. Well, Franco, he's back there in La La Land sitting in the back seat. And as soon as I jerked that troll motor up, he'd be right in the middle of making one of them 100-feet casts. <laughs> and I said, Franco, me and you are going to have to have a little conference, buddy. When you see Hanky picking up the troll motor, it's time for Frankie to set his little hind end down here in the passenger seat. We're going for a boat ride. Don't be making one of them 100-yard casts. So, oh, yeah, okay, boss man. Okay, boss man. Yes, sir, boss man. So it wasn't five minutes later I saw these birds. Man, I was excited, and I jerked that troll motor up, and Franco was right in the middle of making one of them long casts. He just took rod and reel on us, threw it in the water. I thought, oh, my goodness, brand-new rod and reel, just threw it in the water. He was rod and reel. So we take off, and I, I just shake my head, and I go over there, and I get to the, the fish, and we start catching them. And I said, Franco. Man, it just makes me sick. What would you throw the rod and reel in the water for? He said, well, I didn't want to hold you up, boss man. I said, but man, that was your brand new rod and reel you just got. He said, oh, no, that wasn't mine, Hanky. I put mine in the car. <laughs> that was yours. <laughs> <laughs> that was Franco. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's hilarious. We, we, we had a lot of fishing stories and, and uh, a, lot, a lot of good times. And we go back. I, I, I want to go back to that uh, – that first Bassmaster Classic kind of set the precedence for uh, uh, 10 pounds of tackle. Mm -hmm. You could only have five rods and reel, 10 pounds of tackle, and you couldn't buy any. No matter where you went, what lake, you were not allowed to. You could get lures and rods and reel from other contestants if they wanted to give you one. Of course, they're not going to give you one in most cases. Uh, but you couldn't go buy anything. So I get to Lake Texoma in 1979 for the Bassmaster Classic, and they weigh my tackle box. Everybody was allowed 10 pounds of tackle. So when they weighed my tackle box, I weighed 11 and almost, almost 12 pounds. Mm. And, of course, Ray Scott was uh, the president of Bass, and Harold Sharp was the tournament director. So they get to choose what baits they want to take out of your tackle box. Mm. So I got original big O's that are worth 100 bucks a piece. And so they start, and they only weigh about a quarter of an ounce. So Ray and Harold's having a heyday because they got a pound and a half of baits to take out of my tackle box, almost two pounds. So they start taking all these different baits out of my tackle box. And uh, 
Finally, they felt sorry for me. They'd taken all my high-dollar baits and all my great balsa wood baits and hand-carved baits and all my special baits. They'd taken them all. Mm -hmm. So they got down and got into my worms and started taking packs of worms. And so when they put my tackle box back on the scale, it only weighed nine and a quarter pounds. So they started putting stuff. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. You putting stuff back in my tackle box. Now, when I was overweight, y'all had the right to choose what lures you took from me. Mm -hmm. Now that you took too much, I ought to have the right to choose what lures I want back. And they thought about it and talked among themselves and finally said, yeah, you're right, you're right, go ahead. So I took back the pack of worms that I won the Bassmaster Classic on. Mm -hmm. They took those baits away from me. Mm -hmm. Think about, had they not taken too much weight out of my tackle box, I wouldn't have had the worms. I'd have never won the Classic. Well, I'll tell you, too, I mean, the type of person you are to speak up and say something if something's not right. I mean, how many people would have just been like, oh, wh whatever y'all say, you know, it's like if you didn't speak up, I mean, that could have been a game changer. That would have been disaster. Yeah. Curtains, mm. curtains. But curtains. I ended up winning the classic on a pack of of, uh, of man's sparkle tail motor oil <laughs> jelly worms that they took out of my tackle box. Man. <laughs> Oh, I bet you were sweating it when you saw them grabbing all that, the, just the handfuls. I could not imagine. I'm like, oh, because I know you, you were probably meticulous on what you were packing, too. Very meticulous. Oh, man. And I can't believe that the scales were off that bad, you know. Harold Sharp used to always, he was an old railroad man, he'd wear a watch. And he would say, there's one official watch. And he'd hold his arm up and he'd say, you're looking at it. <laughs> and that was it. And you didn't yeah. go by anybody else's watch. If you if he said you were one second late, you were you were a second late. You mm. lost a pound for that. Uh, it, it was his official watch. But it's amazing how things have progressed, things have changed. Mm -hmm. But those old stories, uh, they they still mean an awful lot to me, and 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 I reminisce about them quite often. And uh, I think about all the changes that have been made, where we are today, and where we came from. And mm -hmm. when I started my television show, I wanted to include my family. Uh, I wanted to break away uh, from tournament fishing. Now, I love tournament fishing. Mm -hmm. And I tell people all the time, tournament fishermen are more knowledgeable than fishermen who do not fish tournaments. And a lot of people are offended by that. And, and they say, well, you're saying, and you have no way of knowing this, that you're saying tournament fishermen are better fishermen. That's not what I said. I said tournament fishermen are more knowledgeable. Mm. When you don't fish tournaments and you got a fishing buddy, in your mind you think you are either he mm. or she are the best fishermen in the world. Yeah. That's what you think. Yeah. And you go out and you fish and you, you don't catch fish. Well, we had a cold front. We had a bluebird sky. We had this. It was too windy. Uh, it was too rainy. It was whatever. Uh, fish just didn't bite today. Mm -hmm. They didn't bite. So you believe that. And right. so you go get in a bass tournament, and you go out, you fish all day long, and you don't catch any fish. Right. You and your partner. Neither one of you catch fish. Well, you're thinking in your mind, well, they just didn't bite today. F fish just didn't bite. Mm -hmm. And you come to the scales, and there's Larry Nixon with 35 pounds. Over there's rolling with 20 pounds. Mm -hmm. And you think, oh, my goodness. How did they catch those fish? So now you, you know what did not work mm -hmm. firsthand. You know exactly what did not work. Because you, you spent three days out there throwing everything you knew what to do, and none of it worked. Right. But now the tournament's over, and you find out what Larry did to catch all that big string of fish. Right. So Larry Nixon had it figured out. And he caught them. And so you realize maybe you're not the best fisherman in the world. <laughs> and maybe your partner wasn't the best fisherman in the world. Uh, there's methods and ways to catch fish. Right. And uh, it's amazing the, the things that you learn from experience. And those lessons you learn the hard way, you don't forget them. Right. I, I see exactly what you're talking about. Like with um, people who have fished tournaments, you're more strategic I think you, you're a little bit more knowledgeable because there's more on the line for you versus if you're just going down, you know, to the river, go fishing with your buddy. It's more kind of like that fellowship. Like I could see how people would get 
or caught up. Well, they're just not biting today. It's like, well, you haven't moved. We've been sitting in the same spot for the past 20 minutes. <laughs> you hear people all the time say, man, I threw everything in the tackle box and they just, they wasn't, wasn't biting. And finally I found a blue worm and that's the only thing they'd bite. And in their mind, they, they honestly believe, man, that the only thing in the world those fish would bite is a blue worm. <laughs> You get in the tournament, you come to the scales, and you find out there's 45 people up there in front of you, and they didn't any of them catch their fish on a blue worm. Mm -hmm. So they were biting something different. Yeah, absolutely. I remember going fishing um, and just using hot dog. I remember <laughs> everyone telling my dad, I was like, I bet I'll catch more catfish than you. He's like, oh, okay, because he had all of his, his lures. I don't remember exactly what he was using. He was using some kind of worm. And I just remember I started reeling them in. And uh, he was like, what in the world? It's, it's, it was just that, that hot dog. I mean, just literally a piece of hot dog. Was it Oscar Mayer or what kind I, of turkey dog? <laughs> I think I, it was just your basic like ballpark <laughs> beef hot dog. Well, and, hey, I mean, we, we're sharing a tip there, man. You might want to try a ballpark hot dog. Ballpark hot dog. The biggest catfish I think that uh, Lucy caught once when we did a TV show was caught on a hot dog. Yeah, I'm telling so. you. I'm telling you, they, they <laughs> eat it up. <laughs> That's a hot bait. Literally, a hot bait. Get it? Hot dog. Hot yeah. dog. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, it's so much fun to uh, spend time with your family. And I tell people a lot that, you know, we go to school and we take our kids to school or we're taking them to the, to the school bus or whatever. We try to teach our kids lessons about life, about don't do drugs, don't hang out with bad people, mm -hmm. don't do this, don't do that, study, do all these things. And you're always trying to kind of force feed that. You have very little time. Well, your, your son or your daughter or your granddaughter, they may, they may have so much stuff on their mind, they're going to school, mm -hmm. but if you take them fishing, and you get out on the water or sitting on a pond bank or a creek bank or a river bank, mm. and you're just out there fishing and you're watching nature and you're involved in, in each other, mm. you create an environment that you take all the guards down and you're able to communicate. And that is so important with children. We're always trying to school our children on our schedule and our time when we really ought to spend some time thinking about how can we create an environment that will allow us to really break through and communicate with our children. Absolutely. And, and I think that's one thing that even with the tension involved in the family show, over those years when we would all go out on the water and we'd grill out, cook hot dogs oh, or yeah. hamburgers and and you'd interact with all your cousins and everybody just have <laughs> a great time. We'd say a blessing over the food, and then we would talk about what's important in our lives. It just created that environment that we were able to communicate with one another, and uh, you didn't try to force in a conversation that just didn't fit at the moment. Right, and 100%, I have so many core memories of being, you know, the family fishing show. I remember all of us granddaughters, we would all pile in the basement and we'd watch movies and we'd have like a big kind of like sleepover thing and then y'all come down with the cameras at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I remember all of us, oh, here we go, waking us up so early. But, um, I mean, honestly, nothing can replace those memories with everybody. We get the little girls. We'd always get uh, we'd always get the little girls' little pink tackle boxes. We put surprises in them. You know, we'd put maybe some bobbers and some hooks and some split shot and things of that nature to go fish with. But we'd always put some little snacks and stuff oh, in there. Yeah. And that, that was a highlight. Yeah, that's a highlight. You get them gummy worms yeah. next to, <laughs> next to your fishing worms. Yep. There you didn't want to get them mixed up. No. Hey, <laughs> that might catch them too. You never know. You never know nowadays. Uh, but that, that's kind of the things that, uh, that I like to talk about, and that's kind of the things that are important. And you make memories, and you invest time, and you get big dividends. You know, uh, How many people got their 20-year-old their granddaughter co-hosting a podcast with them? <laughs> right. Not too many people. <laughs> I bet some people are going to look at this and be like, 
why in the world is she on there? Where's she, <laughs> you know? But I mean, I think it's just that um, being there, that fellowship, you know? It's like, and I, I've been there and I learned a lot from you. You know, I enjoy fishing just as much. And I feel like if you weren't as proactive in that, I might not, you know? I feel like a lot of people that have zero interest in fishing just haven't done it right. And in my opinion, people that, oh, I just hate fishing. I can't wait that long. I'm like, you're not with the right people and you're not doing the right things. You know, you just gotta give it another try. I, I tell Hank Jr. and Billy and Ben, my three oldest, I, I was really bad about just getting one pack of crackers and one bottle of water and go out and fishing all day. And I, I fish like I was in a tournament all the time and it, just fishing for fun. You know, like, man, don't waste your cast. Don't sit down. To, and, and I was so hard on those kids. I thought, man, they're going to hate fishing when they get older. <laughs> and I look back and... Uh, Man, it, it was something that they deeply appreciate, and they love it. And, of course, Hank Jr.'s got two sons that uh, are just ate up with it right now, Boone and Cade. And uh, I'm going to have them on the podcast. I, I love uh, fishing with them and the, the kids, and Cade's quite the nut. Uh, and it, it's just really good for to see your family uh, follow along and do and have the same appreciation and the same love for for what I have. And it, it's, it's so rewarding. It's it's cool. It's cool to have you helping me with the podcast. I think that's so awesome. Absolutely. I'm I'm happy to be here and hear all the stories you have to tell, you know? <laughs> I think it's interesting. There there are a lot of a lot of stories and, and a lot of things to tell. I mm -hmm. I have to go back to uh, I think it was maybe the second year I had a television show. And the most powerful thing in television, especially in that era, was what we call a lit roll, mm -hmm. where you, you don't cut the camera off, there's no edit, and it's very obvious to the viewer that there's never been any edits put in, that the camera's just rolling. So I'm fishing with my son, Ben, and Ben, you know, is quite the nut. And uh, so I put Ben on my lap, and uh, he looked like a... A 10-year-old Roland Martin had that blonde hair combed back, and he was a cool-looking kid. And he's sitting on my lap, and I'm showing him. I said, now watch this. I got a hummingbird flasher before the graphs and before liquid crystal. I got a flasher. And we got that hummingbird flasher, and I said, well, look here, Ben. We're in 28 foot of water. Now watch this. All right, it's coming up. All right, we're in 20 foot. We're in 17. Look right there. See those lines? Those are fish. Those are fish right there in 17 foot of water. All right, now, come on. We're up here. All right, we're in nine foot of water. We're going to stop right here. All right, and I cast. I took a, a, a bait casting reel with a Carolina rig on, and I threw it right in the same direction as where I ran over uh, those fish with my depth finder and right to get in that 17 foot range right where those fish were. And so I hand bend the rod. So I'm getting everything ready on my side, getting me a rod out. And uh, I look, and he sets the hook, and his rod's bent double. And I mm -hmm. think, oh, let it be a fish, Lord. Please let it be a fish. Don't be hung up. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I see his line start coming to the top. I thought, oh, goodness, it is a fish. It's a fish. And he's reeling, and I said, you got the bottom bent? No, Dad, I got a fish. I got a fish. And he's so excited, and he's like a little Roland Martin. He's running all over that boat. And, that fish comes up, and it looks like it's seven pounds. I thought, oh, Lord, please don't let that fish come off. Please don't let him come off. So we get it up to the boat, and I get reached down, and I lift that fish, and we put him in the boat. And so I'm turning the camera, and I start talking about this fish. And uh, Ben said, Dad, let me hold him. Dad, let me hold him. Dad, let me talk to the camera. Dad, let me have him. Dad, 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 Dad. And so with a fish, once you let him go, the commentary is over. You can't do anything about it. If you say something wrong, if you do something wrong, or the tape goes down, or you have a glitch, and you let that fish go, it's over. So you always look at the cameraman to acknowledge that he got everything before you let that fish go. Mm -hmm. So Ben, Dad, let me hold him. Dad, let me. I said, Ben, let me. No, Dad, 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 it's my fish. Let me hold my fish, Dad. I, 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 I want to hold my fish, and I want to talk to the cat. I said, okay, all right. Take the fish. I said, Ben, what'd you think about that? He said, Dad, that was more fun than killing a dog <laughs> and threw it back in the lake. Oh, man. We can't use that. <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> what in the world? 
He took that big, beautiful fish. It was everything on a let roll <laughs> and said it was more fun. Where he came up with that? More fun than killing a dog. And he threw it back. So we're done. So my producer at that time was Bill Landers, who passed on. Awesome man. Awesome man. But uh, Bill said, we'll fix it in post-production. So every time that show would come on, that fish would be there. And Bill made his voice sound as if he were mumbling. <laughs> and he said, no, no, no. So everywhere I go, people say, now, your little boy, he can't talk plain, right? <laughs> oh, man. I would, I would rather just have the controversy of what I said than be known as like, hmm, hmm, hmm. Like, uh-uh. He got nervous and couldn't talk plain. Yeah, yeah, that's what happened. That's exactly what happened. He didn't say what we thought he said. But mm -hmm. it, it's so much fun to be able to go back and reflect on these stories and things you forget about, you know. Yeah. I say, Uncle Ben, if you're listening to this, <laughs> when you come on the podcast, don't mumble. Don't mumble. We can't be mumbling now. Oh, uh, we threw him under the bus, but he <laughs> threw me under the bus, so it was payback. It, it, it was a payback time. I fished a tournament once, and uh, I was uh, going from Kentucky Lake to Barkley Lake. And I ended up winning that tournament, by the way. And I won mm -hmm. Angler of the Year for National Bass. And that was the third tournament I won in a row. We talked about my career a little bit um, in a previous podcast about when I started. And I really started full-time in 1976. I did not win a tournament in 1976. I won Angler of the Year for National Bass, but I didn't win a tournament. I finished second like five times. Mm. And then in 1977, I didn't win a tournament. I finished second three times in 1977. Mm -hmm. So I was a bridesmaid. I was never a winner. <laughs> But in 1978, uh, I won my first tournament on Clarks Hill Reservoir in Georgia. And we left there and came to Lake Norman in North Carolina, which was my home lake. Mm. And at Clarks Hill, I won the tournament and I won Big Fish. Then we came to Lake Norman and I won the tournament and I won Big Fish. Mm -hmm. And we left there and went to Barkley Lake, uh, Kentucky Lake. There are two lakes that are joined together. And uh, we took off in Kentucky Lake, but I fished in Lake Barkley. And I won that tournament and won Big Fish. So I won in, in five weeks' time, I won six boats. You got a boat for first place, and you got a boat for, uh, uh, you got a boat for Big Fish. So uh, my yard looked like a boat yard, but it mm. was pretty cool. And I tell all that, but the last day of that tournament, it was... I was making this tremendous run. I had to stop. Back in those days, we only had 18-gallon gas tanks. So I was having to stop uh, three times to put gas in my boat. Mm. And there was a marina called Port Prizer, and it was owned by a guy that I knew well, and he had fished some tournaments. So when we got there, it was so rough that it had beaten my troll motor, had come loose. And so I, had, I went ahead and took my troll motor completely off the boat and just laid it in the floor. So when we got to the marina, I told him, I said, just lay that trolling motor out there on the dock and uh, we'll, we'll, I'll come back and pick it up on my way home. Mm -hmm. So it was the last day of the tournament and I knew I could do that, no big, no big deal. And so when we got to the weigh-in, uh, I asked him, I said, now, did you set that troll motor on the dock like I told you? He said, no, I put it in your rod locker. Put it in my rod locker. Mm. Did you take my rods out? Mm. He said, no. So I ended up, I had 13 rods in that rod locker and that troll motor. The longest piece of rod I had left was about five inches long. Oh. I sent 17 rods or 13 rods back to uh, Fenwick to be replaced and they were, they all went in a Herman Survivor boot box. Oh, man. <laughs> so he broke every rod I had in multiple pieces, beat the handles off the reel, but he just dropped that troll motor on top of all my rods, and we beat and banged in that rough water, and it just was like putting them in a blender. Mm. <laughs> I'm saying, I know you went into him and be like, Ooh. What do you say? I mean, well, yeah, he didn't care. He, he was scot free and got out of the boat, and there I am with 13 broken rods and rails. But mm. 
a lot of things happen in, in the old tournament days. But we got a lot of stories. We got a lot of things we're going to talk about in the future. But I just ramble on. I, I, I hope you can uh, appreciate some of the stories. And if you don't like this one, wait on the next one. You may you may appreciate it. But uh, we got a lot of a lot of stories and a lot of history to discuss. And as time goes on, we may get a little bit more serious. I hope not, but it could happen. <laughs> Uh, I, I like talking about the good times, the fun times, and I will tell you this. Uh, I talked a little bit about Bobby Murray. I talked about different partners. I talked about different people in the sport. Friendship is way more important than all the trophies you can win and all the money you can win. The money mm -hmm. goes away. You spend it. Martha spends the money, and, <laughs> and the trophies tend to tarnish. Uh, but those friendships, man, they mean everything. And when you get my age mm – -hmm. Man, you start losing some of them. Forrest Wood, golly, bum. I think about Forrest Wood and start crying. He, he was so important to me in my life, and he was such a great supporter. We lost Forrest, Ray Scott, Billy Westmoreland, so many of the great fishermen. Tom Mann, what a buddy Tom was to me, and what a great man was Tom. Uh, uh, so these stories are important to me. Uh, they're, they're stories that uh, uh, we'll be able to tell for forever, as long as I'm still alive. But I want to share some of them, and I want to get some of these guys to be guests on my show as we go down the road and, and let them share some of their stories back and forth and mm -hmm. just have some good times. So, Sarah Beth, we got a lot going with this podcast, and we got a lot, uh, a lot of ground to cover. Absolutely. And, and it's going to be fun. It, it sure will. I'm having a blast. I'll say we're only two episodes in, and I mean, just from the stories that I've heard and like reminiscing, I'm like, man, this is going to be good. Well, we're having a good time, and we sure appreciate you uh, joining in. Subscribe. Go up there and hit that subscribe button and subscribe to, subscribe subscribe. to our podcast and uh, say it for me. Subscribe to our Thank podcast. You. There you go. I knew we could do it. I, I, we get it done. But I appreciate you watching and joining and listening. And uh, I hope you'll be back and listen to us again one day or watch us or do both. God bless you. I'm Hank Parker. Tell them bye, Sarah Beth. Bye. Hank, this is Earl. show was stronger than the Sonic Boom. Don't fish